it was the it was the it was the one day. It was the one day, and the benediction had been pronounced. I walked out of the church building to greet folks and to shake hands. You remember that, shaking hands? That's when you put your right hand into somebody else's right hand, you clasp it together, and then you move it up and down like this, and you say, hey, it's good to see you this morning. I was outside just greeting people, shaking hands, and what to my wandering eyes should appear, a fight. In the church parking lot. A fight in the church parking lot. So immediately after raising hands high in praise to the Almighty, two guys said, all righty, and they raised their fist, and they went at it to each other. They, they, they were actually pretty good buddies. But when it has to do with your kids, you protect and defend. And the fight didn't last but a couple of minutes but it disrupted the church's harmony and chemistry for weeks on end. There was tension in the camp. Folks took sides. The friendship went south, and the church's witness was soured. In the Phil Manson paraphrase, opposing paraphrase of Psalm 133, it would go like this. How ugly and odious it is when God's people are at each other's throat. It is like oil and water. It doesn't mix. Always polarizing, lacking the life of God. But let's hear what it actually says in Psalm 133, shall we? How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. The third Wednesday of October, a week from this coming Wednesday, was supposed to be the start of the Sokerville Pumpkin Show. It's, it's been canceled for this year, as the Fairfield County Fair has been canceled this year. But the Sokerville Pumpkin Show has been canceled for the fourth time since 1903. One was in 1918, the other was in 42 and 43. And as you can guess from those dates, it was during World War I, World War II, all because of war. But normally at the Sokerville Pumpkin Show, over that four-day period, 400,000 people will swamp that city of 13,000 for the greatest free show on earth. I mean, that festival literally brought the Pickaway County community and the schools together. All of it centered around the world's largest pumpkin and the world's largest pumpkin pie that you can find in the Lindsay's Bakery window. There's parading. There's eating. There's reconnecting with friends. It's a wonderful atmosphere, how good and pleasant it is when the people of Pickaway County come together in harmony. But that's the scene in my mind when I envision our imaginary family who's been traveling with us in the Songs of Ascent from Psalm 120 up to 134. So if we're in 133, you know we're almost at the finish line here. But the songs of ascent, the family going on vacation, instead of going down to the beach, they're going up to Jerusalem, to Mount Zion, to the mountain for their vacation. And this imaginary family of Caleb and Abigail and those seven kids carting their way to Jerusalem, swelling that small city with thousands of religious festival goers from near and far. And Caleb gave all of his kids, Eddie and Eric and Eugene and Earl and his twin sister Pearl and Peggy Sue and Patty Lou, Gave them all 10 shuckles apiece, just like my dad used to do with my sister and I. He'd give us $5 or $10, however old we were at the time, to go and to find our cousins, to find our friends, and go be with them to buy cotton candy and pumpkin donuts and to ride the turtle whirl. And that's, uh, there's, there's, there's a particular 
one feeling in the air there in Jerusalem, even around people, masses of people that you don't even know. Of course, we wouldn't do that today. But there was a day when you could do that. You're around people you don't really know from another tribe, another community, but they're all a part of Israel. And Caleb and Abigail, they, they had their immediate family with their kids and, and, and their cousins and aunts and uncles and all of that. And then they had their extended family of Israel. How wonderful. How beautiful when brothers and sisters get along, as the Message Bible puts it. And so with Psalm 133, we're told that it is of David, which means David is the one who composed or wrote this psalm that was sung as a song of ascent. But we're not sure when he may have written it, although I have a hunch that it was when, when, when we're told in 2 Samuel chapter 3 that there was war between the house of Saul, that is the tribes of Ephraim and Benjamin, etc., war between the house of Saul and the house of David, the tribe of Judah. They were at each other. And we're told that that war had lasted a long time. But then when we come to 2 Samuel chapter 5, we're told that all the tribes of Israel were united under David. And that may have been the circumstance that prompted him to say how good, how pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. But we're not Israel. We're not Israel. We're not Israel that you are born into. You're born into not only the nation, into that big family, but you're born into the religion. We're the church. It's where you are born again into, where we are adopted into community. It's when God's Spirit takes up the patient and persistent initiative to graciously draw us to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is held out in open invitation to all, whosoever will. So you never know who's going to respond in faith to God's offer, his gift of grace and salvation. It may be the atheist or the adulterer, the attorney or the abortionist. It might be the apple of your eye. It could be the mocker or the musician, the murderer or the mechanic or the mother of your life. It could be the grump, the gossip, the greedy, the gifted, the guy next door. It could be a teacher, a tattletale, a technician, a toddler, or the thorn in your side. They might be Republican, Democrat, Independent, male, female, white, black, red, brown, yellow, tall, short, heavy, light, black hair, blonde hair, blue hair, bleached hair, brunette, bald, straight, gay, rich, poor, blue collar, white, American or not, you never know who will respond in faith. But here's the truth of Scripture. The moment, the minute that person repents of sin and believes in Jesus Christ, they become a member of their family. That's good news. And when they enter... They're not the finished product. They're not the finished product. It's not an excuse to live haphazardly, but it's the reality of newborn believers coming into the family of God. You see, while the heart, the seed of sin, is forgiven, is cleansed, we're simply at the beginning of a lifelong journey of attitude and behavior and language and lifestyle transformation but the truth remains how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. And it takes some ingredients for that to happen. God has it in his mind that his people live together in unity, in harmony. They get along. Whether we're talking on the level of family or nation, even a business, in the church. There's some leaders who believe that unity comes by controlling or by dominating. They're going to force the unity together. There are others who 
construct or they dream a, a perfect plan for humidity, for community. And one group that is perhaps the most guilty of doing that is pastors. M most pastors won't confess it, but we do a great deal of daydreaming about perfect harmony, this perfect imaginary church where everybody gets along. So how do you do life together? How do you do, how to do life together? So that it is good and pleasant, because see, there's a lot of pastors. There's too many who have been burned living in the glass house. And they've just seen it's just been fought with useless and needless and pointless battles, either chairs versus pews or the kind of music that you sing. We've dealt with way too many carnal, selfish, outbursts of anger and judgment, guarding our sacred cows. There's nothing good and pleasant about community because it's, it's, it behaves like that. Nothing. It's caused many to say that they love Jesus, but they hate the church. There's been too many fights in the parking lot. And it's enough to turn people away. And so as pastors, we don't want that. And so we, we write up a vision plan for com church community, organizing it into compatible interest groups, complete with hip branding and catchy slogans and slick marketing schemes designed to reach a targeted po population. And we package programs and we select music for our target. These birds of the same feather, all under a roof of precise building design that appeals to the target. And who's the target usually? It's people who are like me. Whoever the pastor is, they're dreaming up the community. But then I read page 27 of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Life Together. And here's what he said. God hates visionary dreaming. God hates visionary dreaming. It makes the dreamer proud and pretentious. The man who fashions a visionary ideal of community demands that it be realized by God, by others, and by himself. He enters the community of Christians with his demands, sets up his own law, and judges the brethren and God himself accordingly. He stands adamant, a living reproach to all others in the circle of brethren. He acts as if he is the creator of Christian community, as if his dream binds men together. And when things do not go his way, he calls the effort a failure. When his ideal picture is destroyed, he sees the community going to smash. And so he becomes first an accuser of his brethren, then an accuser of God. You didn't make it happen. You failed. And finally, the despairing accuser of himself. And no wonder we're seeing an increase in suicide among pastors in these days. Becoming a good and pleasant, harmonizing community, it does require diligent and intentional effort on each of our parts. But Bonhoeffer goes on and lets us in on the key to community when he says, because God has already laid the only foundation of our fellowship, because God has bound us together in one body with other Christians, in Jesus Christ, long before we entered into common life with them, we entered into that common life not as demanders, but as thankful recipients. Folks, the ideal Christian community wasn't born in my mind, nor is it in yours. It was in God himself. First and foremost, he had the dream. And what is real is the body of believers right here in front of us. 
here and now, imperfect and incomplete, different as we are, not what's down the street. And with Christ in our midst and with those who will come into this fellowship, not because they fit our demographic, our target demographic, but because they confess Jesus Christ as Lord. That is the only thing we have in common. It is the most important thing we have in common. It is not our skin color that binds us together. Lord knows it's not our hair color, or whether we have it or not, that binds us together. It's certainly not our political party that binds us together. But that's the amazing beauty and miracle of the church, is that you take all of these diverse feathers of birds and you put them together, and it's the miracle of God's Spirit working in that midst. And it's a beautiful thing. We confess Jesus Christ as Lord. And we do, as David said, you pour oil and water on that. And I'm pretty sure most of you will want to say to me, Pastor, you don't know your chemistry. You don't know your chemistry. Folks, I know what they say about oil and water. They don't mix. They don't mix. Water is heavier, it's a heavier density than oil. It's going to float to the bottom, it's going to sink to the bottom, or it's going to rise to the top. The molecules of water, they are polarized. Oils are not. But David knew his community chemistry. He knew his community chemistry. He says that unity and harmony, being good and pleasant, is like emulsified oil and water. They do mix. They come together. Notice what he says in here. When God's people live together in unity, it is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. Did you hear it? Oil and water. Dew. Oil and water. We have to wonder, what is it about oil and water that prompted David to say that they are essential to good and pleasant unity, wonderful and beautiful harmony? Well, in, in ancient Israel, the predominant oil was that of olive oil. It was used for cooking, for cosmetics, medicine, lamp for your fuel, lighting in the house. But here David talks about oil that's poured on the head running down Aaron's beard onto the collar of his robe. He's talking specifically about the oil that's used to anoint, that's used to set apart, to consecrate God's priest, like Aaron, who was Israel's first high priest. See, with oil, there is a glistening softness. There's a golden warmth. A, a perfuming and lubricating quality about oil, coating Aaron with the sign of God's presence. You see, in the Old Testament, to anoint with oil mean, meant to set a person apart for God's service, a king and priests. And in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is the anointing oil. He is the anointing oil. He is poured out on all who believe in Jesus Christ, setting each of us apart to be priests to one another and to be ministers of reconciliation between a hurting and broken world who are enemies of God and with the loving Father himself. You see, oil, it lubricates the friction. It softens the hardness of the heart. It emits a sweetening fragrance like oil poured. The dew of Hermon symbolizes water. Dew, of course, is moisture that forms as a result of condensation. But Mount Hermon 
Mount Hermon, the highest mountain in Israel, is located at the far end of the kingdom, 118 miles north of Jerusalem or Mount Zion. It's got an elevation of over 9,200 feet. It is snow-covered most of the year. Today, Israel's only ski resort is on the south slope of Mount Hermon. And ironically, we're talking about living together in harmony. The United Nations maintains its highest permanently manned post in the world on Mount Hermon to monitor the volatile situations along the Lebanon, Syria, and Israeli borders that all meet in the anti-Lebanon mountains. But in David's day, Herman Du was legendary. It was heavy enough that if you were camping up there, you left things out, it saturated everything overnight. So when you have all of this dew and you have this snow melt, it seeps down into the mountain and out of its base, it flows the Jordan River, which means that which flows down. You get it? The oil flowing down, down on the beard, down on the column. The river flowing down from Hermon down to Mount Zion. And that's what Jordan River means, that which flows down, meandering just east of Zion. And so Eugene Peterson in his book, a long obedience in the same direction. He says that the dew falling and coming down Hermon communicates a sense of morning freshness, a feeling of fertility, a clean anticipation of growth for the dry, barren, fruitless Mount Zion. And folks, Israel, nor the church, was intended to be a dry, barren, fruitless circle of disconnected lifelessness, but a flourishing community, blessing one another with refreshing nourishment, green with growth in Jesus Christ, and eager to welcome a harvest of new believers into the family. You got oil and water. Oh, I know, chemically, they don't mix. But in doing life together, it takes the soothing, lubricating oil and the refreshing, nourishing dew to bring about the community that enjoys delightful harmony. And there's four elements that are crucial for the church to be a community where God's people live together in good and pleasant unity, a place where David says in verse 3, for there, when the church lives in harmony, for there, the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Four elements, crucial. The first one. We must be willing to buy in. Must be willing to buy in. Buy into what? Buy into the fact that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. We are his body. I mentioned earlier that many say they love Jesus, but they hate his church. And I, I get what they mean. I understand that. And I tell you, down through history, the church has looked ugly. So I get its meaning, but folks, it is impossible to love Jesus, the head, and to hate the church, the body. It's impossible to do that. You see, the head and the body are connected. You decapitate the head from the body, and you're dead. You, in Ephesians chapter 5, the apostle Paul said that Christ loved the body and gave himself up for her. He loved the church, the body gave himself up. That's how much he loves the church. That no one should hate their own body, but feed and care for it. He feeds and cares for his body, even in its ugliness. So folks, we can't hate, we can't love the head and hate the body. None of us is a head, although there's some who think they are, but none of us is the head of the church. And so we can't be Jesus. And our only option is to be part of the body. But if we hate the body, we'd have to decapitate it from the head, and we're dead. We're done. We have no life in us apart from our connection to the head 
of the body, Jesus Christ. You may not always like what you see happening. I don't either. In the body of Christ. Yes, it has its flaws, its warts, it's got hairs growing in all the wrong places. But when you came in, you brought all of your flaws, all of your warts to add to the ones that were already there. And if you confess your sins, you believe in Jesus Christ, you claim him as Savior and Lord of your life, you are part of the body. You have no option. We cannot escape the fact that we are part of the worldwide church of God that has no boundaries, no walls, but you've also got to be part of a local body. Every letter in the New Testament was written to a local church, a gathering of believers in a specific place, or to individuals who were in a particular church, all of them. And that met in a specific place. The Bible knows nothing of an only child Christian, a lone ranger, a solitary island, just me and Jesus. When we become Christian, our flawed self becomes a part of the body, and we buy into that, which leads to the second element of community that is essential. And we learn to stand down. Stand down is a military term meaning to move from the alert or the combat or the offensive or the attack position to a more relaxed posture, to stand down, to back off. In Christian terms, to stand down means we put pride aside. You see, in the church, Jesus said that we are to deny ourselves. You hear standing down in there? Mm -hmm. We're to deny ourselves, take up his cross and follow him. We're to give up our lives, not save our lives. Stand down. Paul, Paul told the church at Ephesus, he said, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bearing with one another in love, make every effort to keep the, the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. You can hear the standing down. Be gentle, not attack mode. Patient. To the church at Philippi, he said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. You hear the standing down? Not looking to your own interest, but, to, but each of you to the interest of others in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. He stood down, taking the very nature of a servant. You see, in the body, when we demand our own way, when we defend our rights, when we dress down another, when we defy authority, when we declare war, when we diminish the gospel, there's friction in the community, and oil is desperately needed. That oil of warmth, that oil of conviction, the oil of the Holy Spirit presence. The oil is desperately needed because when we come to those points, folks, it is ugly and odious. But there's a third. So we buy in, we stand down, we show up, we show up. One, one of the results of the coronavirus pandemic is that it chased everybody out of the buildings and into the homes including the church. And it forced the church to ramp up. This is a good thing. It forced the church to ramp up its online presence, to stay connected with the family, with the body. And that's a good thing. And many of you, you have expressed appreciation to me and some of our staff about, I'm so glad that when I was sick, when I was in the hospital, when I was on vacation, when I had to work that day, I could, I could dial in, I could watch it. I could see it. I could stay connected. And so for health reasons, we have stayed home. And while we've opened back up, 
many stuff they home for, for a variety of reasons. Those have been shared. Some of those, some of those are the very legitimate reasons. But it was one of our fears at the beginning when this all started, that when we amp up the live streaming, that some just won't show up in days ahead because it's just a little more convenient to stay at home and watch it in my jammies. But the body wasn't created for our convenience. It was created for community. There was a Marine general who said virtual presence is actual absence. Virtual presence is actual absence. And it's the point that he was making that heartily affirmed, it's heartily, heart, heartily affirmed by anyone who's standing on the beach waiting for the Marines to rescue them. We can see you on the screen, <laughs> just can't get to you to rescue you. The pastor of Hebrews chapter 10, he expressed the same concern. Whether he had a coronavirus pandemic going on in his church or not, I don't know. But he said, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Folks, it's real hard to do love and good deeds virtually. You just can't. There are believers in some countries where it is forbidden for them to gather, but they find any reason, they, they go to extreme, secretive extreme, to find ways to meet. That's why they call it an underground church. They know what it means if they're caught, but that's how deeply they value community. We really do need each other in person. I don't, I don't care how digitally connected we think we are. When we're doing that, basically we're just staying informed, and that's about it. Just staying informed. But you see, when we're gathered together, if you are harboring a hidden hatred towards another, and we gather at the Lord's table, folks, you get that? If you're harboring the resentment towards somebody and we're coming together at the table, see, online you don't see each other. We, we see each other. And we make eye contact with that person that we harbor the ooh, ooh. And the conviction comes. And the confession comes. That's oil at work. You may battle with anxiety concerning the upcoming election. But you know, you hear the preacher declare Christ's victory and Christ's vindication. You hear the shouts of amen all over around the sanctuary, reminding you that you belong to a heavenly citizenry that is allied in hope. That is water, refreshing water, nourishing water at work. We can download biblical truth virtually, but you cannot feel the warmth and experience the atmosphere or witness the truth becoming enfleshed in the family of God. This isn't just a church issue, folks. I hear it from college professors and their classes and teachers. I hear it from parents who are trying to get their kids online to keep them engaged. I, I hear it all across the board. In doctor's office, you, you name it. And what I'm finding with the isolation is an increase in depression, murder problems exacerbated off the chart, abuse skyrocketing, and care diminishing. We need each other. Showing up matters. And there's a fourth. And as Aaron begins to come, there's a fourth, fourth element. You buy in. You stand down. You show up. 
and we carry out. We carry out. Folks, we don't just hunker down in our little fellowship huddle. Christ has given us a mandate. He's given us a mandate to go and make disciples, to give cups of cold water to the thirsty, to visit prisoners, to clothe the naked, to bind up the brokenhearted, to bring good news to the poor, to love your neighbor, to live righteously and justly, to be salt and light, to be ambassadors of reconciliation. Jesus said that we need to be in the in the world, but not of the world. And we come back to Bonhoeffer and what he says about living together, community. He said, Jesus Christ lived in the midst of his enemies. Where do you live? Where do I live? Where does the church live? So the Christian, too, belongs not of the seclusion of a cloistered life, but in the thick of foes. And Bonhoeffer goes on to quote Martin Luther, the German reformer, who said this, the kingdom is to be in the midst of your enemies. And who who will not suffer this does not want to be of the kingdom of Christ. Did you get that? He who does not want to suffer this does not want to be of the kingdom of Christ, of the body of Christ. He wants to be among friends, to sit among roses and lilies. Not with the bad people, but with the devout people. Oh, you blasphemers and betrayers of Christ. Ouch. If Christ had done what you are doing, who would have ever been spared? Would you agree that that's true? So we come to one table. We come to the table as one. Like oil and water, to partake of grape and bread, emblems of his shed blood and his broken body, the very means of joining his life the very means of joining his life as the body of Christ. So how good, how pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. We've bought in. We stand down. We show up. In order to carry out. And when we do these, that's when David says, for there, the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. So we take our elements. The bread, symbolic of Christ's body broken for us. So this is my body, given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. Then there's the only way in through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the only way you got in. It's the only way I get in. It's the blood of Christ poured out for the forgiveness of sins.
So this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you. Drink it. Be thankful that you are part of my body. So let's drink together. He is good. Oh, it's so good. So how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. For there, the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. God bless you. This morning, we have ushers who will come to dismiss you from your sections. But also for parents, you will go back in an orderly manner to pick up your children one by one. Tiffany will have them ready for you. But it's been such a joy to worship with you this morning. Thank you for being with us online. May God's blessing be upon you. God bless you. <laughs>